Is this an anaerobic natural episode? Because it's juicy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's juicy, baby. Whoa. Oh, is this an Ethiopian yoga chef? Because this thing's juicy. Is it actually? Is this a Brazilian chocolate boy? No, I like it. I like it. Uh, well, let me know. Ready to roll? Sweet. Well, ready? I'm ready, baby. Welcome back to the It's Just, Just Coffee. Coffee. Podcast. I'm Kirk Pearson. And I'm Rowan Cook. And today we have, as we said, a really, really juicy podcast for you. If you've read anything in like modern Australian news cycle, you always see like the, uh, the almost, what's the word I'm looking for? Armageddon-like articles oh, about yeah. work from home coming to an end. And so we're going to tackle this subject because we have the, the title of the episode really is Work from home, is it killing the coffee industry? So uh, we are going to dive right into this topic. It's a really juicy one. I've done a lot of research and quite frankly, I think it's going to cause some outrage. A lot of people are going to agree with this and I, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Shall we get straight into the coffee news and then we'll, we'll do the things? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first up... Pardon me. Bit of rust. All right. So first up in the coffee news, the EU is delaying the implementation of deforestation regulation by a year. So we spoke about this with Caleb Holstein. The European Commission stated that it was allowing more time to phase in responding to calls from global partners who need additional time to, to become compliant. The regulation would have disproportionately affected coffee growers and, ha- and it would have had a profound impact on coffee businesses across Europe. The regulation also had an impact on the commodity coffee market. After the news broke of this, actually, the commodity price just dropped so entirely. So interesting back down there. Yeah. So I had to ask you because I was reading through the notes of the podcast and I was like, isn't deforestation regulation a good thing? Um, cause that was my general takeaway. I'm like, why are we complaining about this? But can you explain a bit more to me, like what this means? Like, why is it affecting coffee farms? Well, I had no idea about how this was such a big issue, uh, until we actually had Caleb Holstein on the podcast yep. and he kind of explained it to us that for coffee producers in Colombia or in Africa or anywhere, really, if they want to supply to Europe, they have to, um, prove that their coffee wasn't, uh, no trees were, or forest was deforested. Uh, for their coffee to be produced so that they can actually supply to Europe. Otherwise, they can't um, right. uh, when, once this is implemented. And so the problem is here, it's like some may be deforesting, but the the problem is here that some of them might not be. They just can't go through that certification and prompting to prove that they aren't. And so that means that they can't then sell into the EU, which is causing that problem there. So it's kind of like, even though deforestation regulation feels like a good thing, maybe the way that it's laid out at the moment is kind of, guarding some people from their livelihoods well, it's and total, surviving. It's totally unworkable for people in Europe to ask people who live below the poverty line to become compliant in these things. These people might not even have a computer. Like for all I know, they don't have a computer that they can actually do these things on. They have to research it and then you've got the impending date coming along. It's like they cannot possibly become compliant. And while in theory, the deforestation regulation is unambiguously a good thing. You know, we, yeah. we should all be making efforts, but like- just imposing that on producers, it, it's not what – they can't become compliant. It affects them disproportionately and it affects the coffee industry in Europe. Yeah. So You see a lot of the problem with these bills and with things that are passing where it's like on a whole, like you hear it as a statement. You're like, yeah, great. Of course I'm into that. Of course I don't want deforestation. But it's when you dive into the nitty gritty and see how it affects thousands, if not millions or whatever, people's lives – um, that you really start to second guess and, and look at how it's all playing out. And and I think some coffee producing countries have come out and kind of slammed it as well because obviously it's a big market and and they've kind of said, well, look, this is just going to make it hard to supply and it kind of, you know, it's it's protectionist, I think was what some yeah. people said. So we'll see. Interesting stuff. Uh, but the next piece of news we had was actually, Liam, we're going to we'll play that if we, if we can. Um, you know, we get a lot of, coffee's getting a lot of bad PR you know, people just taking shots at coffee yeah. um, a lot these days. And we've spoken about it on the pod. I don't really like how people are attacking the industry in one way or another. But I mean, it feels so easy. It's something that everyone wants to drink every day. So it's mm. like, what an easy thing to have a jab at. But yeah. if you want to make, you know, have a go at everyone that's producing and making coffee and doing it, what are you going to have to drink? What are you going to have to drink? But I've got a bit of good news for the coffee industry. Ooh, so let's listen to this good news. Uh, about the health benefits of coffee playing now. 
two things in it that people don't think about. One of them is soluble fiber, prebiotic fiber. So if you're not using a paper filter, I don't recommend paper filters. If you're doing that, you get the coffee finds that just give more body to the cup of coffee. It tastes really good. Well, it turns out that feeds your gut bacteria. Mm. There's also the stuff that makes coffee dark and it's called polyphenols. And you Love probably heard of melanin. Right. This is stuff that gives you darker skin. Well, there's also melanin behind your eyes use that. and in your brain. And neuroscientists used to call it junk melanin because they didn't understand that one of the things melanin can do is it can convert sunlight or heat and vibration directly into electricity. So it's serving an electrical function in your skin. And this is why if you look at a 90 year old white person and a 90 year old darker skinned person who has the better skin and doesn't look like they aged. Black don't crack, Dave. Exactly. Black don't crack. You said it first. And so that's because melanin is actually a superpower. Biologically, it does stuff in the realms of quantum biology. Coffee has two things. All right. Well, I mean, melanin is yeah. good for us. Look, uh, look, um, Dave, Dave got a bit, uh, he, he got a bit wacky towards the end there. In I'm just going to say, if I hear good news about coffee, I'm all in. How um, great. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. We and want then, a bit of good coffee PR. And then whenever anyone's like, how many cups do you have a day? I'm like, well, did you listen to what this guy was saying over here? It's uh, helping me. It's uh, giving me that melanin. It's giving me a... Uh, Poly, what was it? Poly, polyphenols, polyphenols, Love soluble them. fiber. Ooh, soluble yeah, fiber. Yeah, we, we all know what it's like when you've had a few in the morning, and it, it's it's basically just the invitation to the bathroom. So you know, you know. I, I do have to, you know, the disclaimer of this like statement at the end. The guy who uh, is talking about this also claims that he's invented biohacking and does not use sunscreen. In Teddy, instead, he takes anti taxinathan I don't poly. Podium and eats tallow and grass-fed butter to protect himself against UV. He also claims he injects himself with hormones to develop a tan. So, you know, do yeah, some, but he says do good, your own research. Yeah, but he says good shit about Calvin. Oh, yeah, well. but that, that was factual. You're, that you're, was you're, you're, you always have to... And there are studies out there that are listed here that um, back up what he's saying. So, you know, there's... Uh, I'll take. I'll take it. I'll drink more coffee. Yeah, no, I'll I'll take it as well. But let's get into the nitty gritty of it right here and right now because we've been pl we've been wanting to do this episode for some time and we kind of agreed that now's about the perfect time to do it because like coffee, work from home is kind of in the, the the crosshairs of the mainstream media at the moment. I always see articles almost daily about how work from home could end. And they're basically scaremongering um, yeah. a lot of the time and sort of it, it's clickbait and it, it gets a lot of people upset and. Because work from home has become this thing that we all, it's normalized now. Yeah. Uh, and so, but it it has had this really transformative effect on the coffee industry and um, which is, which which we'll elaborate on throughout. And the, the food industry and the every food industry, hospitality. hospitality Let's just talk, you know, if you sell things that people eat or drink, work from home's changed that forever, yeah. um, in my opinion. So we'll get into it now. Yeah, I'm going to just run down. I mean, the first question that you have to ask, the biggest question of all is, is work from home killing the coffee industry in Melbourne? My answer is yes. Yes. As we know it. As we know As it. As we know it. Because right now, um, are you, were, you, were you reaching for that button? So ready for that button. Oh, go. go. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> that's, that's spicy as. Because, because coffee, you think about it, like it's five years ago, how the, how the industry was and how quick it's changing. And, um, you know, the pandemic really induced a lot of that because it's revolutionized working from home. And so in Melbourne in particular, we have this big coffee culture where Monday to Friday, there's these uh, cafes that are really, uh, well, they were really successful uh, at the bottom of an office tower that could have thousands of people working in it and selling hundreds of cups of coffee a day. And it's really, you know, quite a good venture and, and things like that. They've been like their trade is almost like fifty to forty percent less than it was pre-COVID now, because of people working from home. And in Melbourne, there's a there's a lot of people that you know don't come to work on a Monday. They don't come to work on a Friday. There could be various reasons why they don't come into. But also flip that, then it rains on the Thursday. And so they go, screw it, I'll work from home on Thursday, then I'll come in on the Friday. Yeah. And then just flips up the whole week. Yeah. And that's one of these things that's really tough. And because of this environment where you can't really predict yeah. uh, when people are coming in, it's really hard to operate your venue. And it kind of makes everything worse for everyone. And to give you an example of this, say, for example, you can't properly staff your cafe. On one of those days when it's especially busy, the operator gives a sort of low quality service. They don't have as many staff, so you have to wait longer 
your coffee's probably not made as well. You have a bad experience and you kind of punish them later by not coming back. And the staff has a bad experience working, getting oh. pumped with not enough staff or having yeah. too many and standing around doing nothing. And people might listen to this and say, and say, well, Kirk, you're having a bit of a sook, but someone's got to go into bat for these people, for the, for the business operators and stuff like that because it's, it's, it's really impacting the worker, consumer, business operator. And I will say, I think that this is um, – just you bringing up that about the the bottom of the businesses and bottom of you know skyscrapers and that the the coffee shops I'm just stumbling over my words there. I'm so excited I can't even speak. Um, I think this is a great app for those that are maybe people looking to get into hospitality themselves mm. or start a venture because regardless of whatever we're talking about today, you can't deny the industry is changing and will change. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in here that um, might be good foresight and good research. And, you know, you'll go into some things that you really need to look at as you start it. I did have a question. When you talk about those dates, um, obviously it being so much harder and maybe the industry is evolving. Do you think that if the date was set for the work from home date, like let's say across the board, it was just, I, I know we probably couldn't do this, but it's just Friday. Does that help in any way? Having like a lock date that you know will be different? Of course it would. I mean, if you can plan, planning is always essential. Like say, for example, if you're planning for a public holiday when you know the city is going to be busy, then you can plan roster ahead and you deliver a better service. Um, but there's you can't do that Monday to Friday in, in the city anymore. And I don't think this is an exclusive to Melbourne thing. I think it's Sydney. I think it's across the world. Yeah. Uh, so because there's entire industries that have been changed enormously by this. And you know, off, the, off the top here, I want to just say that when th- this, I feel like the city's forever changed in Melbourne and in Sydney. There's just less people coming here, um, and it's probably not going to change back anytime soon. But the 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 negatives of that, it's the world doesn't revolve around cafes. Okay, we we all know that the, it does not revolve around that. But when people are working from home, and and I don't I don't know that their money, particularly especially in a coffee li- cost of living crisis, goes elsewhere. There's less people getting employed. Suppliers supplying less, which means you know they're employing people less and making less money, and this all contributes to the tax revenue as well. So it creates a bit of a um, bit of a problem there, and the, it hurts the Australia's overall GDP. So all these all the, these less transactions, and I don't know if there's any evidence that I've seen. There's an anecdotal people anecdotally people are saying, well, people just spend their uh, money in cafes in the suburbs. Is there any evidence that actually proves that? Yeah. Because I see a lot of vacancies in rent, in commercial um, real estate in like a lot of the suburbs, inner suburbs of Melbourne, outer suburbs of Melbourne. Is there any evidence that proves that? And also, I mean, my coffee company is kind of testament to the other that more people are making coffee at home. Yes. And like, yes. you know, that the rise of that, the rise, I know the stats on the sales of these machines, like the amount of brevels that are being sold across Australia, across the world, um, look at Ninja coming out with a new machine, KitchenAid coming out with a new machine. It is the biggest booming market in home kitchen appliances. And and off the top here, I think we it's another interesting thing to say. And maybe we can this this would be one I'd love to have as a short actually, Liam. So start posting that. Um, coffee's maybe having its blockbuster moment. And blockbuster is in like people are still drinking coffee, like people still watch movies, but they don't go to a blockbuster store to get it. You know, we're ordering more coffee online. We're making more coffee at home, and less and less going to coffee shops in the city. So, you know, so do you think net Netflix is Breville and all the home machines is the Netflix of this situation, kind of hitting blockbuster, the original cafe scene, and work from home? Yeah. So I think it, it this this whole thing and. The pandemic made people realize they can effectively work from home. Yeah. And so a lot more people do it now and a lot more companies implement it because it works for them. Um, but it, rightly or wrongly, it means the coffee industry is changing. And I don't think, I think as an industry, we need to be prepared not to not to bash down the doors to demand people come back and demand that things go back to the way they were before because they won't. I don't think they will. And so we need to kind of shape our industry around that. We are having our blockbuster moment. So it has to be the interesting side that work from home is doing this. But I guess one of the questions is it's never going to be the same again. And maybe the cafes. And I mean, to be honest, that's why we started Golden Brown the way that we did. We started during the pandemic. It was because of the rise of coffee machines at home and that kind of thing. So maybe there needs to be that evolution from cafes as well to see where are the other revenue streams and the you know services they can provide um, to kind of fill that gap in the market that's happening? 
And one interesting thing that I found in the research that I was doing for this is that there's actually more cafes now in Australia than there were before COVID. So you think about you think about that. People knowing that there's more cafes now. So listen to this quote that I found on Instagram of uh, Phil, uh, wrong one there, Phil DeBella from uh, DeBella Coffee up in Queensland. Do you think there's too many cafes open in Brisbane or in Australia in general? Yeah, totally. Look, before COVID, 19,000 cafes. So 2019, 19,000 cafes. Uh, The end of last year, 26,500 cafes. Uh, We simply don't have the demand um, for the supply that's out there. And every time a new cafe opens, it dilutes business. So what's the perfect number? We don't know. But we certainly need some sort of regulation to make sure that we're not allowing people to open on every corner and um, driving others to go bankrupt. No one wants to see anybody lose their business. So we do need to find that equilibrium of where where the supply meets the demand and demand meets the supply. Now, I was going to bring this up. I was going to play the devil's advocate of like how much of it is the work from home and how much is it just having too many hospitality ventures out there. I think this statement of, I don't know if I agree with regulation, Mm. um, that might feels a bit like well, sometimes we have to let markets do their thing, right? And maybe yeah. that's like the the one shred of neoliberalist I have within me. But you know, when, <laughs> sometimes markets just markets just sort things out, and unfortunately, the, that comes at the expense of, in this case, business owners, because yeah. there's 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 not enough for everyone. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, if you business owners, you know, you, if you're opening one, you're taking a punt. You're yeah. taking a chance. Uh, there's no guarantee that you'll succeed. In fact, there's statistically you won't. Yeah. So, um, th- but that I just found that astounding. There's more cafes now with less customers as well. Less customers. There's more cafes than there were before. That's crazy. Yeah, I would. Uh, what do you think that is? Do you think like people are coming out of COVID and everyone's like, I don't want to work my crappy nine to five anymore? And then like, I tell you what, cafes and restaurants have like the like sexiest appeal of like, I'm going to go and cook food and serve people and like lovely. And then you do it and you're like, this is a nightmare. <laughs> oh, it's hard. And it's you hard know, work. Like I opened up a cafe eight months ago now and the first three months you're not making money. Yeah. Um, it is if a not lot- longer, like, and that's a good, yeah. run, that's a good run. <laughs> yeah. And like you, you wonder if you ever will. And it's a kind of lonely, um, you know, trying period when you're not. So it's very testing of your mentality and you have to keep going and, you know, like everyone's the same. Everyone everyone goes through something similar. Um, but yeah, it, it just, I found that really, really fascinating that that there's more now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, jumping onto the next question here. Do you think that working from home is fair on all workers? Uh, yes and no. Because I'll start with a no. Um, and I think if you're, say for example, um, you work in a company like Starbucks where a lot of it is, you know, baristas in there making coffee and they don't have the option to work from home. If I worked at Starbucks and my boss, my upper manager worked from home and was, you know, demanding I do things X, Y, and Z way while he's in the comfort of his pajamas, that would really piss me off. Yeah. Uh, and because it's poor leadership. You know, if you're not willing to prove and willing to do the same thing as you're asking other people to do, other people to do, then that to me that's poor leadership. Yeah. Um, you know, the, we've got this new pajama pants CEO um, kind of thing that's happened since the pandemic, and you know, uh, look, I don't really love it. Um, but on the same time, yes, it, it is kind of fair because. You know, imagine um, you know, if you've bought a house during the pandemic that's 100 kilometers away from the CBD, you've proven that you can effectively work from home and then you're being required to come to the office. Like, I think that's also a bit of an issue as well. I wouldn't want to be in that situation. Yeah, I think it's a weird balance. I definitely agree with something like a Starbucks if someone's trying to manage you from afar. I think, you know, I mean, I, you don't know if that's happening, but like that, that feels like a crazy thing. But then... Sometimes from there, I don't know what the balances are of that kind of leadership of being the CEO and making the decisions. Cause like, you know, you could make a decision as the CEO in a three minute span that's a really powerful, strong decision for the direction of the business that is going to provide growth and stability for the people that are getting their paychecks from it. So whether that determines you need to be around the people or not, there's that. But I do think that like, I do definitely think that face to face interactions between leadership and staff is a lot more building and a lot more um, healthy than not having that. But I have seen other businesses that that do it that are fully remote, that have people in the US and the UK to Australia. Um, But maybe when they're all working from home, that's a slightly different situation. Yeah, like it just, 
it, it, for me, that particular example of companies that have like executive management in that do work from home and then, you know, service staff or, you know, people that work on the factory floor that don't like that, that's just, if that's, that's more of a private company issue, but I would never uh, sign up for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at this, do you think that the workers will return to the office at the level that they worked at before the pandemic? Do you ever think there's a time where the amount of people going into the office is going to be the same as it was before? No, that's a flat no. Yeah, um, and, I agree with that. Yeah, and because uh, like there's just the, there's a there's myriad reasons why, um, and because like I do think they'll re- there will be more than there are currently, say two to three years from now, and we've seen some examples of that already sort of coming into play. Amazon uh, just rena- announced that globally their staff. Uh, without there's going to be some special exceptions, their staff will be required to attend the office five days a week. Which is huge. That's a huge company that is based off technology that you would assume would be one of the companies fighting for work from home. Yeah. And I've got a, um, I've actually got a list here of companies that have sort of announced that they'll require their, um, their company's uh, staff to attend at the very least three or if not five. But can I ask a quick question on the Amazon thing? Mm. They must know something there, right? Like Amazon is a very stat-led business with a lot of technology that would do it. They must know that the productivity is down from work from home than having people in. There'd be a reason why they're making this giant call. And there's the, there's a theory out there as well that some companies are doing this to actually bait their staff to quit so they don't have to um, offer redundancies sort of thing. Ah. So if they if they implement this and a lot, of people, um, they, a lot of people become unhappy and quit, they kind of want some people to quit so they can because they're going to lay them off anyway and save themselves the extra expense. Um, which is one theory, theory that's floating out there. Um, and an interesting side is probably the people who are like, this is a cushy job. I just work from home, only mm. work a couple of hours a day and just have a, a one of those little birds just touching my oh, mouth. Oh, the Homer Simpson, why? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Having well, one of those little pecking birds just going mm. up and down, touching the space bar so that it looks like they're active. But these are some of the major companies and organizations that are implementing uh, return to the office mm-hmm. mandates. So Amazon. Salesforce, the New South Wales government, Tabcorp, Barclays Bank, JD Sport, Deutsche Bank, Manchester United Football Club, IBM Consulting, and Dell. So you're telling me the Manchester footballers are no longer going to be able to do training from home? Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't even know. I don't even know who a Manchester. They're just standing in front of a Zoom, anymore. just off and back and forth. Yeah, they 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 can no longer work from home. Ugh. Terrible, um, I have to get back to the field. So so more and more people are being required to come back to the office. So to answer your question, which was, do you think uh, more people, uh, will it ever return to the amount it was before? No, uh, yep. I don't. But I, I think it will increase from where it is now. I'll be really interested to see how this plays out over the next couple of years or so, because I would have thought coming out of COVID that we'd be in a permanent state of you know work from home at least a couple of days a week but it'll be interesting to see if it kind of slides back the other way i mean that's an interesting list with some big names but in terms of how many companies out there it's still a short well, list well i think yeah there's more to come yeah. um and i don't say that to alarm people but it seems like what that's what the trend is um and just to back that up as well there was a kpmg survey of i, th- I think a couple of thousand ceos 82% of respondents expect white-collar workers to be back in the office five days a week in three years. Right. So um, that's that's a survey of top CEOs by you know a top firm. So that's pretty indicative to me. So I've got an interesting question here for you. Would you rather – I mean, would you – hey, you're working in a cafe. If you had an office job, would you want to work from home or from the office? If I had an office job, I'd probably want to work from home. Yeah. Liam? I think I would actually prefer to work in office. Yeah. I mean, our job's a little different. I feel like you kind of, it's a lot easier in well, well, to, to Liam's just uh, invoked something in me. Like I kind of thrive off that, off that interaction with people. Like I'll, get, I'll do my job better if I'm at the office. So my question is, would you rather, oh, we're going to hit a would you rather. I'll go down the barrel of the camera here. Would you rather work from home for five days a week or work from office four days a week and always have a three-day weekend. You bitch, you stole my question. But anyway, I'll, I'll let you roll with it. My answer is work from the office four days a week. Did I steal that question? I thought we were talking about it with Molly. Did you bring it up? It was me. <laughs> In my head, we brought it up with Molly. We can cut this section. Have I, I just I did steal that 
from Kirk. I thought uh, no, no, no. Molly we, talked we, we about can it. With it. We can roll with I it. I would, I would say, oh, office for sure. Four days, take that. Well, that, that's that's precisely like. But I'm interested to know what the people at home are thinking because there are probably people who work from home that are like, oh, I can work from home. I don't have to commute. I don't do this. Maybe the five day would still be easier for them. But for me. Office. office well, this, baby. this is another. This is another angle to this. Some companies are offering people who work in the office more money than those that work from home. There's some people that are happy to accept a lower pay rate because their quality of life and all those sorts of things. But there's some companies that are saying, "Look, you'll get a high, you've got a higher chance of a promotion, and we'll pay you more if you come into the office." And that's a really interesting angle to this. Yeah. Um, another angle is like, what if AI and automation kind of does away with a lot of these people's jobs in the future and, um, you know, they're less competitive to keep their jobs. What if they prove that working, that you don't need to work in the office so well that they just outsource it to someone overseas that's cheaper as well? Yeah. You know, what, what, like, because that's a real, that's a real angle to this also. So, yeah. I mean, that's something that they need to look out for. Now we just have to, you know, just the peek behind the curtains. I just realized that was your hot take that I've stolen. So it was. Now- now there's no hot take. Uh, I'll, I'm pretty good. I'll cook something. You'll on the cook fly. something up on the fly. All mm. right. I, I do apologize to listen at home. Just to continue Sorry. that conversation, Koki. Um, w- if we went by, like, let's say KPIs of someone's job, and they're arguing that I want to work from home, if they're still hitting their KPIs for whatever work they are, they're doing, do they deserve to be paid less? They're still putting out the exact same. No, no. You know I mean? But this is this is this is the I guess the unfairness of it all. I guess is that you know your boss doesn't really care. They they've like they're sometimes your manager. They have their own ideology. They have their own train of thought. And you know even though you might be performing, and we live in a society where merit is definitely not awarded. You know, um, uh, nepotism is rife. Uh, you know, it's been shown that a lot of males get promotions over females and even paid more to do the same job. So we, we live in a society where, um, yeah, the, it, you, you're not really equal in a lot of ways. But um, I think you, you're less likely to get noticed if you're not in the office. It could be, you know, getting getting the boss's coffee. You can't suck up as easy. I don't know. But, like, you, you won't be noticed as easily. Are we are about to see a generation similar to that, like, classic authors where there were these, like, female authors that had aliases that seemed kind of gender gender neutral and we're going to see, like, well, you don't even have a profile that has gender. It's just, like, this is my output at, for my job and I work from home and that's... So no, what, no one at your office even knows who you are. What, You're working what, from yeah, home. Yeah. You have a 3D Facebook avatar. And what, just what, like, if you, what if you're just a number as well? Like, oh, you know, yeah. This is employee oh, one. Oh, God, we're getting dark here. Mm. Oh, 1,782. I feel, I feel like that's quite real though. Um, and I, th- there might be actually positives to that because you're just seen by your output or is that a bad thing? And maybe that's part of like, I, I always use Sam, I'm... Uh, many many of the places I worked, I was a bit of a personality hire, mm. and so like being in in house, it was like it was always worried, like making sure that the vibe was on. You know, um, can't do that working from home. Can't do that working from home. Not as easily. Yeah. No. Um, moving on to this, what impact? What will the impact be on our state, on our culture, with declining visits into the city? Well, I'm going to answer this question with a question, so I'm going to put it to Liam oh, first. Here we go. When you think of Melbourne, what are what are what are, when I say to you Melbourne, what are three things you think of? I think coffee, food, arts. Rowan, uh, coffee, footy, and then this is just the tourist one, laneways. Okay. Well, I, I put down coffee, sport, and bad weather. Yeah, <laughs> but, but do you notice there's a theme within all of them? Coffee. Coffee. Coffee, so, food, culture, yeah. Coffee. Yeah. And what I worry about, <laughs> if we have um, declining visits to the city and less and less coffee shops, less and less things, le- and not just coffee shops either, bars, restaurants, anything to do with uh, food or beverage, if we have less and less of those, are we harming our own culture? Are we- what 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 happens there? What if we do we really want to become a society where you can't go try on a pair of shoes, where there's there's nothing for you to really go do in person? It's all done online. Like think of Uber these days. Like we 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 killed the taxi industry. And now there's this great big monopoly on Uber. If you have a problem with your um your Uber ride, who do you call? You can't. Like I had an issue with my Uber the other day. I, I really should have got a refund. Uh, 
it, it just goes to nowhere. And that's kind of what I feel like is going to happen with society at large if we just have this sort of contactless system where we don't have coffee shops to go to because we don't have people visiting the city so they can't justify the business. We just can't have less and less things to do. Not to defend Uber here, but what did you do? Like if I have a problem with my Uber, I just go into the complaint thing and they normally reply and they're like, I've refunded your ride or like this is Yeah, I think I got like five cents or something. So, you know, and then it's like- I feel like we're lying here. I feel and, like that is not what happened. And then and then after that, uh, then after, no, it did happen. And, and then, then someone came that, around the corner and slapped me in the face and said, that's from Uber. Yeah, yeah, effectively. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if we don't have these bars, if we don't have these coffee shops and the lame ways aren't flourishing, what do we become? Um, Sydney without the beaches and who wants that? <laughs> Not me. Not me. Like, yeah. not even Sydney wants that. It's like, what makes Sydney Sydney is the beaches. Yeah. But, like, yeah. you can't even go get a, a beer past 8 p.m. there. Uh, but maybe other side of the coin, do you think to your blockbuster, to your blockbuster kind of call from before, do you think that this struggle could be like, you know, the little grain of sand in the cracks of the concrete that grow out and flourish into a beautiful flower? Like, do you think that this strain could mean innovation in the coffee industry that maybe brings us back up to the glorious coffee giant that we once were? I mean, I look at you, you are very forward thinking. You are very, you have taken on your cafe and looked at the times. You haven't just been someone that's like, oh, I'm just going to open a cafe and it's fun and it's all the vibes. Like you've gone in, you've created a very interesting menu with a lot of different coffees. You're servicing a very particular type of clientele. The way that you're brewing the coffee is ever evolving and changing. So maybe this kind of pressure to succeed is going to lead to more innovation um, in the industry. Well, no doubt. I mean, there's going to be changes that will happen to cater for the modern need. Um but I also worry that there's like a lot of the, a lot of, uh, let's just say market share will go to chains and things like that. Are we, are we a chain city where we like to go to a Starbucks? No, we love the independent coffee shops and people when they travel here, um, they, they love that as well. I think there will be a lot of good innovation because you need to be able to make coffee with less people using less coffee for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Do um, you think we'll move to the chain mentality? It'd be interesting to look at like, if that happens, because I feel like Melbourne forever has just like shunned the chain. And when something tries to become a chain, like, you know, even like Huxter Burger or like mm. those kind of things, where it's like, as soon as it starts getting too big for its britches or kind of everywhere, it's like, no, this isn't that boutique experience that I was looking for. But it'd be interesting to know if that that mentality has started to change at all. I mean, especially with, you know, the economic crisis, mm. there's definitely uh, the need. I mean, LD, people love LD now, like there mm. are people who will fight you if you say anything bad about LD just because of the uh, how accessible it is. Well, and it's it, that's an interesting point to bring up because it's so it's so hard to be in competition with bigger businesses as a smaller operator now. Yeah. Your coffee costs more, yeah. just like you're buying the exact same as a bigger chain, but it costs more because you buy less, so you don't get that bulk discount. Same with milk, same with everything. Um, and then you're paying a higher rent. Some uh, big companies get offered like free tenancies or discount tenancy yeah. because they just some landlords just want their um, them in their their building sort of thing. It so, is an interesting point of like we we were trying to start a coffee um, for our audience to speak to the cost of living crisis called the Cozy Coffee, which was just we were working with our coffee suppliers to be like whatever beans that you need to get rid of that are at a low price at whatever it is. We'll take them and we were going to put it in a white unbranded bag called the cost of living coffee and we'd just sell it for as cheap as we could. So on our website, there was always an option that you could do it. But still, at the minimum cost with like delivery in that, we'd still be looking at like $35 to $40 a kilo um, at, with like no profit. But then you go to Aldi and they're selling a kilo for $14 mm. and you just can't compete with that. We gave them a bit of free PR with one of our reels. That I kind know. Of, uh, I don't I know, know if it was, we should have done that, but yeah. we did. Yeah, we um, did. But, you know, it, this goes to my point. What's Paris without a croissant? You know, what's Italy without pizza or pasta? Crap. What's Melbourne without coffee? You know, like what What if we harm, what, what, what if this goes too far and we, we kind of harm our identity as a city that you moved here for in the first place. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people move here for that, what you said, the art scene, the bars, the culture, the, the coffee, you know, all these things. All right, all right. That's all well and good, Mr. Senior Preachy over here. Oh, but yeah. if you're going to go on and on about like what it's doing, what are the ways that we change this? How can we get more people into the city? What can we actually do to make Melbourne great again? Ooh. Donald Trump. 
Oh, okay. Now we're, now we're really heading out. I liked. Um, Excuse me. Excuse me. Look, I think we need to make it easier to get to the city. Um, first of all, first of all, like in Queensland, which is a far, the northern state of Australia, for those listening abroad, um, they've actually got fifty cent public transport fares. Which Just make it free. I, I think we should make it free. Like uh, you know, I don't know how we financially do that. Um, we've got a wee 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 wee. I'll give it a pause. Wait till they're gone. Anyone didn't hear that on the recording? There was an ambulance driving. Ambulance pass. driving past. Hope they uh, hope they treat whoever they're looking for well. Um, but yeah, free or very cheap public transport fares. We've got this really dumb Mikey card <laughs> in Melbourne. I believe that's changing. I've actually got a customer who's working on building the systems to make it just a bit more of a tap on with your card sort of thing. And I also state how much did it cost to implement that Mikey thing? How Billions long, of how dollars. How long could we have given free public transport off the cost it took to implement oh, that stupid yeah. Look, system? It's been a disaster. It's been a total disaster. But that's one thing. I think removing the I barriers agree. to come to the city, uh, whether you're you know, not necessarily driving, but make it free for people to come. There's like make it free to people come in, enjoy, and support the businesses in Melbourne. Create a bit more ec- economic activity. Second thing, clean the city up. I think like sometimes I walk through Melbourne right now. It's a bit of a dump. Yeah. Like we, you know, hose the hose the pathways. Um, clean clean things up. You know, uh, like what, shouldn't we invest in just keeping the joint clean? Like, what did you when you're in high school or primary school or university or anything, even in just life? Did you hear about Singapore growing up? Oh, and, the and cleanest place. If you spat out your gum on the street, you went to jail. Exactly. That was That's, always, that, the, thing that was, that was always the thing. And like, even when I've been to Singapore, it's just clean. You mm. want to, you want to go you be in the city. Lick that footpath. You want to lick the footpath. Yeah. Eat, eat your, eat your food off it. Uh, but just clean the place up. I think we've got. I think Melbourne's just a bit sort of dirty at the moment because we haven't got as many people coming through. And I don't know. Just I feel like we need to improve our image and just take a bit more pride in the cleanliness of the city. Um, you know, that's that's one thing. Uh, allowing people to choose their hours uh, and organizing certain businesses like you were kind of alluding to before to come on particular days. Like, yeah. let's smooth it out. All right, well, why don't we have zones where certain people come to the office, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and other people come to the office in a different zone, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The ease up congestion on the public transport, ease up congestion on the roads, and have these kind of zones where yeah. businesses can collaborate and think, you know, let's get people into the city – a bit in a bit more of an organized fashion or have more people that start their day at 7 a.m. in in the office because some people are early risers and have some people that start their day at 9, some people that start at 11. Like, what's the issue there? Even to a smaller scale, just like the office buildings that you were talking about before, if a cafe that was in the bottom of an office building knew that no one was coming in on Friday, mm. you can easily staff to kind of handle that. Yeah, yeah. Um, or just close. So I, I don't know you, I feel like you're more educated on this and you know the financial impact from a government level on this. But what do you think about like when we first had the pandemic and we were coming out of it, there were like rebates or whatever offered that if you went to a restaurant in the city, you could claim it and get like 50% back. And no, I'm not saying necessarily 50% back, but do you think there is some kind of incentive that the government could offer to get more people coming into the city? Uh, look, on that rebate thing, no. I yeah. mean, as much as I'd love to see it, we don't have unlimited money to be funding people buying coffee. And we don't want to really be an industry that's propped up off handouts or artificially propped up either. We want to be our own standalone industry that uh, functions profitably and you know within a market that's not propped up by government. Yep. Is, is my answer on that. And um, and that kind of is better on everyone because one, you're not going to have the uncertainty that will be ripped away. And two, it's it's just a venture that sort of self-sustains. We don't need governments intervening, intervening on it uh, in, in that way. Like I think there's certain things they yep. can do to to sort of benefit the industry more at, at large. Yep. Sure. I think uh, the other thing we were talking about before with that innovation is look at the markets that you can hit rather than the home market being the downfall um, of, of the cafe, make your cafe stand for that home market. It's a lot easier to just sell someone a bag of $60 bag of beans mm. than make them a coffee and do all this. They walk in, get the beans, walk out, offer services that are going to do it. If people are going to be making coffee at home, they need to know how to make their coffee at home. Our channel can attest to that mm. by how many people want to follow to know how to do it. So offer a 10-class um, you know, tutorial or yeah. like, you know, workshop well, where people pay to come down. Like there's your day pay- rate paid. Well, this is kind of what I was talking about when I said we were having our blockbuster moment. And it's like the coffee indus- industry is changing. City life is changing whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not. And so having these, um, having this mindset of like, what can you provide? Well, um, 
Well, you can you can sell things that really accentuate the home experience. Like people still come out and buy coffee, even if they make coffee at home. Mm-hmm. They still come out and do yeah. it. Um, so you can have beans f- to sell at home. You can have milk or something that brewing you sell. Gear. Brewing gear. You can offer them um, advice. And back at you with the consumers as well. If you want to learn things that you don't necessarily get from videos that you have more per- uh, more needs for, go in and ask your barista as well. Well, there's always the way of like, I can do a video and explain it as succinctly as possible and do that. But there's no feedback loop apart from the comment section, which can get difficult. When you're in person talking to someone, you can see it, you can feel it, you know, you can learn a lot more. And I know that people, if someone worked with me for an hour, they'd learn more in that hour than they could from watching countless hours of my videos, you know, that Mm. kind of thing. Yeah, then having that in-person experience as well. Yeah. Um, I think one of the interesting things with this, we've talked a lot about the coffee industry and about how work from home has affected that. Let's kind of broaden that picture. How do you think work from home is affecting us as a society? Do you think as a society, as people, it's better for us to go back to the office or it's better to continue looking at this work from home model? Well, I wonder if the mental health aspect of working from home has really been a benefit to people. I I question that. I really do. Because my own experience working from home, I hated it. Yeah. Because even though I had more flexibility to put the load of washing on, clean something, eat whatever I wanted for lunch, save a few bucks here and there, play Zelda at lunchtime, like I don't think it actually made me happier because there's those those, uh, cravings we have as human beings, those fundamental needs we have for interaction that just aren't quenched by having a Zoom call with your boss in the morning. And it exacerbates the it exacerbates people who already are struggling with mental health and that kind of thing where it accentuates it. One of the major things that like, you know, cognitive therapists are going to talk about is like, you know where you're not going to find the answer? In your apartment. Yeah. The answer is not sitting in your apartment. You need to get out and you need to have some experiences. And I know that can feel overwhelming. I'm not taking that away from anybody, like the anxieties and things that can sit within that. And work from home did make it very easy that like, when I was working from home, I got terrified at the idea of going back into the office and it you need that readjustment period. But I don't think, I think you have to have very strict rules on yourself if you're working from home to make sure that you're getting the right amount of boundaries, social interactions, um, and also not burning out from your work. Well, if we recall back to the pandemic as well, when we, when you know, most of the world got locked down for some period of time and that feeling of going and being able to see people after the, the um, stay-at-home orders were lifted or something, it was just that feeling of elation was just there. And, you know, getting that feeling daily, I think we really do crave that as a, as a, as a sort of people. We, we, we like that interaction. And, you know, I, you know, I, I really question whether the mental health get the, whether there are mental health gains from work from working at home full time. Yeah, there's obviously the the things that help you mental health wise. Like, let's say you work live far away from where you work, and you don't have to worry about the stress of the morning, getting up, of getting to work, balancing that. If you have like family or a kid at home, that you are able to like balance that out and spend mm. more time with your kid, um, and like those sides of things. There's definitely benefits towards well, it. Well, that's a good segue into what I wanted to talk about next, and yeah. that, and I think this work from home is a benefit at large to women in the economy. Cause you think, you think about having a child these days and, you know, so I've, like, I would like to think, you know, I don't know, actually have any data, but I think a lot of people would supp- would back me up in saying that overwhelmingly women stay home to take care of the kids, right? Still? Yeah. No, I'm not sure what the numbers would be. I don't know. Well, I, I'd, I'd say it's more than half. I'm going to, I'm going to go out and yep. guess, which means that those women across their lifetime will have less savings in their superannuation. That might be 401k uh, for yeah, Americans. Yes. So that's like, you know, the retirement savings. So work from home has been a benefit for women. So who are we to uh, kind of say to people like, you know, what, what do you have a, a child for just to shove them into childcare yeah. and to not spend time with them and to have to work to pay for that childcare? Yep. That doesn't make sense. And, you know, even like, and that's where, like, I don't want to see people in the coffee industry saying we demand people go back to the office because one, it's, you know, we, we need to have this sort of social goodwill with people who are in the office because they're a massive part of our customer base, massive part. But also there's like a moral benefit to society if more people can sort of work effectively. Now, I'm not saying that that should be everyone. There's there's cases clearly where work from home is a good thing and we should make allowances for that um, or companies should make allowances for that. But there's, there's, there's clearly an ethical right here in having some people being allowed to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And even if, in, even if from history, if that's been the case with women working from home, even on the other side of like, 
if the you know the husband or is going to stay back and take care of the kid the ability to be able to more so to your point about like what's the point of having a kid if you're not going to spend time with it yeah um it just feels like that is uh, one of the benefits of work from home that's allowing people to get more time with the family but i've spoken to parents that come into the cafe and it, it's kind of like it's it's a really tough for them and it's probably not good for uh, the ch- maybe, I, don't, I don't know this. I'm just speculating, but maybe it's not the best thing for the child if they if they don't get to spend time with their parents. Yeah. Um. You know. I don't. I. I haven't got a kid. I don't plan on having one soon. But I can't imagine that the point of having one is to just have them go to childcare and then slave away having to pay for that childcare because childcare is expensive oh, and yeah. there's there's a shortage of childcare providers in Australia. And I I I, I speculate as well. That could be the same across the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, jumping back to the cafe side of things. So I've talked about, there's maybe actually a shift of more people starting to go back to the office. You listed some of those companies before. What do we think that cafe owners need to do? Can cafe owners rely on people returning to the office with their business? Is it just a waiting game? Cafe owners cannot rely on people returning to the office. Flat out, no. And because we don't know how this thing is going to, how the next few years are going to play out. There could be another pandemic. There could, who knows? Who knows what could happen? Um, but they flat out cannot rely on that. And they should not plan around that as well. Um, I think we need to, as an industry, we, like the, the bottom of the office tower cafe is probably becoming less and less appealing to a lot of businesses. And even when I looked at um, when I looked at opening a cafe and I looked at the bottom of the office tower style building, it's like, this doesn't appeal to me because, yeah, you've got X amount of companies in the building, but how many days are those staff members coming to the office? It's not vol- It's not really mandatory for them. No guarantee that they're going to be customers. Um, you know, what's the what? Like, how long are the companies going to be there for as well? There's there's no guarantee, and this is why I think that we should. If you're if you're opening a business in Melbourne, Sydney, abroad, even. Um, you should probably look at opening something that's closer to like a touristy area where you've got more people that will reliably yeah, come into the come into the office or come to the city each day. And that's a good point there of like this is off the topic of doing that. But we talk about like the signature drinks or that thing that makes you stand mm. out. What do you want when tourists come into the country, they go to the web and they search best X in Melbourne, best whatever. They look at a list and they go there. So if you can make yourself stand out, get in one of those locations, it's easy to get to. That feels like a a great option to take. And I think it's really interesting, you know, point of view for those looking to get into the industry that that bottom of the uh, building kind of spot could be on the way out or Mm. a bit harder to manufacture. What are, what are holidays like for you? I've never asked you this. What is it like, you know, Christmas break, Easter break? What's it like? Well, we're, our cafe is at the bottom of a hotel actually. Um, and so they're great because there's more people (laughs) traveling and that that was not something I really calculated as being like a big deal. I thought school holidays, holidays might actually be a quieter period, but it's been good because like for me in that particular circumstance, it works. And then we're, close to sort of the football stadium and stuff like that as well. So you, you get benefits when when there's events on. Uh, when Taylor Swift was in town, that was great. I love the Swifties. They're be- welcome back anytime. And the Formula One as well. Yeah. Um, so, What's your favorite T-Swift song? Oh, 22. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm 22. What's yours? Um, oh, what's that one? Uh, I knew you were trouble when you, you walked, walked in. in. I was going to say that too. Okay, that, that's a bad one. It goes, bam, bam, bam. But I think we need to have a recalibration or reassessment as well of what these leases are worth because it's so expensive to rent a place in the city in Australia, whether it's Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, you name it, Brisbane. Um, And so we probably need to really ask ourselves the question, are these worth the big bucks anymore? Are they? Because it's such a big expense and it's a killer. So many hospitality venues fail. And I'm not talking just coffee, you know, food. Bars, all of them, they like the the rate of success isn't actually that high, and so uh, we probably need to reevaluate and reassess as an industry how much rents are worth in the big cities now. Because I don't know, I think their value is sort of declining. Yeah, I agree. W- what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. I was going to ask the question of like we have no information about whether the suburban cafe is doing better, but you know whether that does become a more viable option. Like you talked about a tourist area. I think it's also smart just looking at like, I worked at a cafe that was near like two to three schools. And man, you just be like, bang, mm. school drop off in the morning, bang, yeah. before the school pick up. Like you just get hammered every mm. single time. And so p- thinking about all those like finer details could really be the difference in your business success. But let, let's look at this through 
a bit of a, another lens as well. So we're talking about having a cafe in the city, reevaluating the, the, whether the lease is really worth it and the conditions that you face as a business operator. Because if you want to be a cafe owner in Melbourne right now, you need to be able to predict the weather. You need to be able to predict what protest is going on whatever day. You need to be able to work around holidays, public holidays. You need to be able to pre- you need to be able to predict a whole bunch of different things, and it's kind of impossible. Like what public transport's going to be down? What protest. day? What 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 wars started that we all need to shut the city down for this week? You know, it's just like the, there's so many different things that you contend with. And you don't have any power over, but you've really got to be able to monitor. And it's another sort of factor we need to lay in because Melbourne's got so many protests going on. I can't even keep track of it anymore um, for a variety of different reasons. You know, obviously there's war overseas. There's union union uh, strikes at the moment as well. So it's for – and various other things. I can't even keep track. But you need to be able to predict those as well because they affect your business. So from your like stance, from what you've learned, if you're looking to lease a coffee shop or a cafe in Melbourne and set it up, what are the things that you should be looking out for to make it a better chance of success for you? All right. Well, you really need to look at the price and whether it's um, – because that's going to be obviously the biggest constraint on your business. Can you afford to pay the price? Foot traffic, nearby office occupancy, upcoming infrastructure projects. So if you release this cafe and then they build something for three years, um, you know, right out the front of your doors where people can't access you anymore, that's a problem. So you need to know that. Um, get an inspection done by your builder as well. Mm. I've heard of some cafes opening where they, um, you know, the wiring for the electricity or something's not done correctly and that's an issue. So getting like an engineer, an electrician, a builder to come in, a plumber to come in and expect, uh, inspect rather, uh, what the situation is there and whether it's all functioning properly at all. And then you're going to have huge liability after. Um, lease terms of nearby offices is a big one. So I know someone that we, we mutually know someone that's got a cafe uh, in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, had a great big company move out um, during his lease term and so finished theirs. And that's just like declined his customer, like dropped his customer base enormously. So things like that. So how long are these offices going to be hanging around for? And will that, if you take this lease on, are they going to stay? Um, So you you need to, you need to factor that in as well. Uh, And then of course, get a lawyer to look over your agreement. So, you know, the, the contracts and these things can be, um, yeah, sometimes there's loopholes in them that you don't, that you don't see. And so one fortunate thing my business partner and I did was we hired a lawyer to kind of look over it all and they pointed some things out. It's like, you need to get that clause amended. And, you know, it it really helps enormously. Wow, that's, I mean, that is some very insightful stuff there, Kirk. I never thought it would come from you, but uh, wow. that was really great. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, like this is, this is a topic that's, I see so much in the yeah. news right now. And it's really scare, like it's a scaremongering campaign to me. And, you know, as much as the, like, like I have the fine inter- financial interest in people coming back to the city, and so, but I mean, I really, but I've got a realistic view of what's actually going to happen and how you know work from homes kind of benefited a lot of people as well. And we, as an industry, we shouldn't be there uh, eroding our goodwill with the public, sort of saying you need to come back to the office. Um, I don't think that's really fair, and I don't think it's realistic either. Yeah, I agree with you completely on that. And uh, you know, I just want to say thank you. A lot of uh, time and thought has gone in, a lot of insight from you this week. I think uh, the listeners will find this one really helpful, especially anyone looking at potentially um, starting up something of their own. Um, you know, we touched on a lot of things here. Sometimes it got got a little hot, and uh, to be honest, it was it was starting to fire me up a little bit. I was getting a little bit steamy, steamy under the collar. And are you really? It's feeling a bit. It's feeling a bit warm in here. Yeah, well, I'm actually getting pretty red too. Yeah, I think it's time for an extra hot take with two sugars. Did I say extra hot shake there? I don't know what came out of my mouth as I yelled that. We both yelled it. Hopefully it just sounded good. It was just so hot. Yeah, it was so hot. I was flustered. Um, Now, I famously stole your hot take about the (laughs) work work at the office for four days or work from home. Well, Uh, can I I, I articulate that how that was going to go? So I'm going to say, I'm going to repeat this one, then you're going to do your hot take, then I'm going to do my hot take 2.0, which was that- This could still be a good snippet here. So let's do it. Let's get it in. What were you going to say? Let's bring in the four-day working week. Now, I think it's unfair to, to an extent to ask people to ask all people to come into the office five days a week. I mean, it's like if I was in the office, like I'd maybe want one or two days at home. I, I can understand that. 
But does anyone lose if we just work four days in the office? Like you get a you get you work four days, so you get you know three three day weekend. Those four days require you to come into the office. Who loses? You get four more productive days the, uh, as a business. You get an extra day off as a staff member. Who loses in that equation? That is a win. I'd take four days every day of the week. And then you get the flourishing cafes and business like businesses in the city. It's like I think they'll take that that option as well. I think it's a scenario where everyone wins. Yeah. And I think the four day work week's interesting though, because I just feel like it needs to be across the board for everyone. Like if like all industries just need to be like, it's four days. I think it's hard when only one place does it and another one doesn't, because then you have on days, off days, and it's bizarre. I feel like across the board, just mm. Melbourne, four days. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Let's four days. That's good recycled hot take. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that was worded a lot better than how I bought it in. So I do apologize. <laughs> you did very well there. The lead up was fantastic. Um, now my, I've become known for, I mean, a hot take is a hot take. It's yeah. just that. Yep. I don't want this to be taken, um, you know, the wrong way, but it will be as the comments have rightfully shown. I'm going to say that the cafe closures in Melbourne in the long run could be a good thing for Melbourne coffee. Oh. And it may not necessarily be the closures as much of we're being pushed into this blockbuster moment where people are having to evolve, having to change, having to push the envelope to make a better product, more innovative product. And I think this kind of push on the industry could maybe bring some people to really bring Melbourne back to its glorious great coffee days. Okay, so th- that's that's an interesting thing because I don't think you're sitting there really hoping that someone you know gets themselves into a financially perilous situation. Uh, you never want to see anyone suffer or struggle, and I don't want anyone. I don't think the closures are good, and I think hurting people financially is a bad thing. Just from an evolution thing of the industry, I think it could lead to innovation in the area. And I guess that kind of um, is a good is a good point to reference what we the clip we played earlier. There's more cafes in Australia than there were before COVID. Now, yeah, uh, and and that's kind of like yeah, you know, demand's exceptionally high for coffee in Australia, but supply is exceptionally high as well. So we're kind of at a we it's it's too competitive. Uh, we've kind of been a victim of our own success in a way. So I, I agree with you there. So the video that we watched talked about bringing in regulations so that you can't have a coffee shop popping up in every corner. Basically, I'm assuming they were saying like coffee shops have to be a certain distance away from one another to make sure that there's enough supply and demand there. I don't know if that's the right answer. Do you have any thoughts on like this amount? Do you just need let? Do you need to just let the market kind of play out how it is? 100%. Because like what go, like regulation might stop a good operator entering Absolutely. the market. Imagine like, if you got stopped. Well, I mean, yeah, imagine if I got stopped and, you know. The world would be missing out on that mango lassi latte. Uh, which would be a terrible thing. But like, An you Italian know. Italian classic. An Italian classic. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> With I, your Italian roots, yeah. Uh, but there's some there's some really good people actually opening businesses in Australia at the moment as well. Like, uh, like you know, I think Leon up at Officer Coffee, over there in Coburg, yep. that, that, that's been a great spot. Um, who else has opened a cafe this year that we really like? Dan Dix opened a few, uh, opened a couple. You know, I wouldn't want to say he, like he's he's bringing something good yep. to the there world. There are other places as well, like Bench Coffee, that are yep. kind of bringing a different experience to it and tasting experience. So the way that you go in and that, like, like for is great. if Good Measure never opened and they yep. weren't they weren't opening, uh, they weren't able to give people the Mont Blanc, which has contributed to the city massively. So yep. um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to see over regulation. Yeah. Uh, to, to be perfectly Ooh, honest. Oh, what's the great little um, Japanese place that opened on on Wellington Street Kirby? in Collingwood? No, no, no. Well, there's another one I'll shout out, City Saints. Oh, uh, yeah. That's a good place in Collingwood. You should all go check that out. I've got a video coming on my channel about that, actually. Ooh. Mm. Japanese place on Smith Street. You, wanna, so. you guys talk and I can look it up. Well, we well, Wellington Street, Wellington. Oh, Chiaki. Chiaki. Yeah. So they're doing, they do like good coffee in that, but then also do like beautiful little like bento kind of plate things and yeah. situations, which is really good. So naturally some places will out-compete other places and, yeah. you know, cause other closures. That's kind of how the economic, how yeah, life works. So, I mean, yeah, if we, if we regulate it, then we kind of disturb the natural order. And like we've kind of come to the conclusion of in here, coffee's having its blockbuster moment yeah. where the, the industry is changing and we just need to change with it. Now, it's time for Extra Hot Take 2.0 because I had mine viciously stolen from me. Yeah. Um, coffee shop owners, 
food venues, bars. Stick to your niche. And what I mean by sticking to your niche is like we, we made a decision as a business not to do food. And I think it's been the best thing ever. It took us time to, and we miss out on some customers at certain times, but I think people can rely on us to deliver them what we what we promise is that it's good coffee made consistently within a pretty good time frame. So like nice and quick. And if I had to make a bacon and egg roll with the same amount of staff or a bagel or something, it would hurt the coffee service and hurt me overall as a business and our image as a business. And so I think that was a good conscious decision. And there's a lot of like, salad bars out there that for whatever reason have a coffee machine I, I don't even know sometimes even hairdressers have a like a coffee machine like having an automated one that's like supplying something to your customers yeah like your people are getting their hair cut great but like a hairdresser is that really going to be a, a you know busy coffee shop no I don't, I, don't, I don't think so as the you know Gordon Ramsay always says if you walk into a place and it has a small menu you can probably bet that they're going to be doing all those things very well yeah and so and same with same with cocktail bars like do your thing and and mm-hmm. restaurants as well like don't like I think I I agree if it's got a smaller menu it's probably a good thing sometimes I go to those you know Asian stores that have a hundred things and I really enjoy those as well you know ordering by the number but you know Stick to your niche, I think is my hot take. Yeah. But we almost skipped over something. Oh. oh. Uh, you alluded to a Better Call Saul um, reference. Oh, yeah. At, at, um, in the coffee break. In our last coffee just, break, yeah. And so, and we've got a little bell here. And you're, oh. so could you grab that bell, please, Rowan? Do we're, I need the bell or do you need the bell? Uh, I need, you need the bell. Okay. But we're going to do a special edition of rapid fire questions. Are we ready for this, Liam? With the bell right on that corner of the shopping. Um, yep. All right, cool. Does Ford? this guy ever Look, shut up? Oh, no. Oh, come on. He's the producer. Little Ford. Yeah. Little Ford. Ford. Little Ford. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Somewhere there. Can yeah. I just hold it? Yeah. Okay. All right. He's going to hold it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we, so you talked about Better Call Saul. One of the famous characters in that, Hector Salamanca, answered everything with a the bell. There we go. Um, so we're going to do a special edition of rapid fire questions. So it's only 10 questions. But you answer yes or you answer no. So your way of answering yes is to ring the bell. So we got it? Yep. So no timer on this one. No timer. So yep. if you if it's a yes, ring the bell. Cool. All right. We are ready. So it's- hey, it's just questions. Not doing the timer. Okay. All right. So remember, yes or no. So first question, do you have Italians? You should ring that bell. The, the more accurate <laughs> answer would be to ring that bell. Do I look, do I look good today? Okay, all right. No, the bell's working. Do you have a hemorrhoid? Didn't ring the bell. Okay. Do you love Lord of the Rings? No bell ring. Are you Hector Salamanca? Okay, well, I love that. Are you welcome back in Italy? Okay, that's a good, accurate answer. Is the shred still going well? Oh, the shreds are going well. All right, we had a famous incident this morning where a member of the, uh, the this company was late to work. So is, without naming names, is Sam on the hot seat today? <laughs> okay, whoa! Are you enjoying Better Call Saul? Are you a millionaire? Uh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's, he's nodding his head no. But that, that concludes rapid fire Hector Salamanca questions for today. That was a good one. That was great. I liked just ringing the bell and having to speak. <laughs> well, maybe we'll do it again. But um, look, thank you all so much for listening into this one. I think a good thing for you to do would be to tell a couple of friends about this podcast. Oh, yeah, that'd that'd be great. If you're loving this, share it with a friend. We, want, we, we love doing this and we love doing uh, episodes where I think we'll, we'll probably do a few more in the future where it's just you and I and we lock in on a topic and, and discuss it in the way that we have today. But uh, I think this is a, a really interesting topic and one that I hope people listen to and take a bit of learning from in the industry as well. We need the goodwill of the public to to excel as an industry. So we shouldn't yep. burn our bridges with, with people and people that are working from home. Yeah, agree. Thank you for all the work that you put into to it today, Kirk, and for all your insights, um, it's probably a good time to just state, go and check out Project Zero in the city. Uh, go yeah. and see Kirk. That's uh, get into the city and go and support your local cafes. Um, make sure to email us in. It's hello at itsjustcoffeepod.com. We want your hot takes. We want your suggestions for guests. We want your suggestions for topics. Whatever you'd like to know from us, we'd love to hear from you. It always warms my little heart when we get a message and I'm like, oh, people are listening to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, the numbers are going well. We're getting uh, a lot of new listeners coming in. So make sure to share this with a friend. Then hopefully, um, you know, if you're in Melbourne, maybe 
like some uh, get some live shows going yeah, towards the look, end of the year. Yeah, look, that is definitely going to happen at the end of the year. I think we might even have a Christmas special coming up as well. So. We need to work out the uh, the Sydney audience as well. Maybe we need to do a little tour up to Sydney, do a live pot up there. I would love to. Yeah. Um, um, so thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Kirk, you are beautiful and I love you very much. You are sexy and bring back or bring in the four-day working week. And as always, it's just coffee.